Few people would deny that one should treat people like Fatsik without condescension, as fully one's equal, but in my experience, hardly anybody is capable of it. I've seen only a handful of people do it in my life, and I'm 63 now. In one way or another, condescension portrays itself in how we speak, in the tone of our voice, in the demeanours of our bodies. And that shows, I suspect, how few of us really believe in our hearts that those who suffer severe mental illness, especially if it looks to be incurable, and if the mentally ill, or those mentally ill, are radically bereft of any social standing. It shows how unlikely it is that we believe in our hearts that these people are really fully our equals. It's one thing to feel affection for such a man as Vatsek, even justifiably to esteem him in a certain way. Vatsek is a good man, Hora often told me. But to show affection for him or to esteem him without a trace of condescension? From where one, would one get even so much as the idea that that makes sense? Aristotle, to whom many moral philosophers now turn for inspiration, would have thought it absurd, and in a way it is. The rational thing, after all, seems to be to respond kindly with a very benign condescension to such a person who, after all, seems to have lost everything, almost everything, that gives sense to our lives. In what I hope is not an intrusively didactic moment in the book, I express my sense of what rare human beings my father and Hora were. I quote, I've never known anybody who lived so passionately as did these two friends, the belief that nothing matters so much in life as to live it decently. Nor have I known anyone so resistant and contemptuous of the external signs of status and prestige. End of quote. I hope that in the telling of the story I could show, rather than state, the kind of men they were, and that the authority of their example would illuminate the dramatic events of the narrative, show, rather than state, what I had learned from them, especially what I had learned about Vatsik. What I knew as a boy, revealed to me in the example of my father and horror, deserted me when I was an adolescent at boarding school, and I quote now. My father and Vatsek visited me at school in Ballarat. As soon as I saw him, my father that is, I knew that his illness had again overtaken him. He came dressed in a dishevelled navy pinstripe suit with a dirty white shirt open at the neck, the collar partly covered by the collar of his jacket. He seemed shrunken, stooped, not with age, he was only 39, but with a burden of his affliction. Most startling was his face, thin, unshaven, his eyes not dead, as is often the case with depression, but burning with a terror of his visions, all made worse by the fact that his almost shaven head made him look as though he'd come from a concentration camp. Vatsek walked beside him in an equally shabby beige suit and an open dirty shirt, wearing as ever his beanie. He no longer had a beard, and his open, amiable face was covered with stubble. His eyes focused on no one, his lips were hardly ever still, moving in sometimes silent, sometimes audible conversation with himself or with imaginary partners. Afterwards, a teacher asked me if one of the men had been my father. No, I replied. I was later tormented with guilt and shame for having denied my father, but I knew not quite why I was ashamed, because I also knew that terrible though it was, my denial was not prompted by cowardice. In the German translation of Romulus, I deleted that last clause, that it wasn't prompted by cowardice, uh, because the thought in it is too compressed. It depends, amongst other things, on a contrast between shame and guilt that's not explained in the book. Guilt feeling, or remorse, which I take to be much the same thing, is for what we have done. Shame is for what our deeds reveal about us usually about our character. I felt guilty because I denied my father, but when I was a boy, I wasn't sure what fading of character that had, that had revealed. And when I came to write about it in Romulus, I wasn't trying to deny failings in my character, but I was trying to suggest that my denial of my father had a deeper cause than reference to failings in my character could convey. Our tendency to connect virtue and power Virtue and social standing goes so deep in us 
Think of how deep, for example, is our longing that virtue should conquer and be rewarded. That when they come radically apart, when people appear bereft of social standing and suffer affliction that obscures all visible traces of dignity, then it's almost impossible to see their full humanity. Their virtue will be invisible, their humanity only part, partially visible. And that's why Simone Weil, a marvellous French philosopher, says that, I quote, compassion for the afflicted is more miraculous than walking on water, healing the sick or raising the dead. Her point and mine is not psychological, it's conceptual. The miracle they refers to is not that we're able to resist temptations that threaten the will in its execution of a clearly perceived duty, nor is it that we're able to resist temptations that would obscure clear vision of our duty. The miracle is that we're able to retain a sense, a belief, that even those who suffer the utmost degradation can be the intelligible objects of a compassion that is entirely without condescension. They did not think, as that great and noble German philosopher Immanuel Kant did, that reason could reveal in a person who is physically and psychologically utterly degraded a dignity that, as we now put it, is inalienable. I'm quoting her again. The supernatural virtue of justice, she writes, consists in behaving exactly as though there were equality when one is the stronger in an unequal relationship. Exactly in every respect, including the slightest details of accent and attitude. For a detail may be enough to place the weaker party in the condition of matter, which on this occasion naturally belongs to him. Just as the slightest shock causes water, which has remained liquid below freezing point, to solidify. I'm not religious, so I can't speak as they does. But the divide that she records when she calls justice a supernatural virtue, a virtue, by the way, that she believes should not be distinguished from charity, is real, I believe. It's between two conceptions of the ethical. One is overwhelmingly natural, and the other is in some way mysterious, if not actually an offence to reason. I had it in mind when I distinguished earlier the virtues of character from which my fa for which my father is so often praised, and the goodness to which I wanted to bear witness when I wrote the book, saying of the former that they're heroic virtues. In many of my writings, I've reflected on the difference between the two conceptions of the ethical that I'm about to sketch. Both go together, indeed, are interdependent with a conception of what it is to be a human being, and therefore with a kind of compassion it's intelligible to show to a human being. One is an ethic of assertion, or at any rate, an ethic for the relatively fortunate. Its defining concepts vary culturally and historically, but they cluster around autonomy, integrity, courage, nobility, honour, and these days, much more often, autonomy. The second, no, <clears throat> sometimes nobility is the focus, as it was for Aristotle, but as I said, in contemporary uh, ways, autonomy seems to be the prized virtue. The other, the second kind of ethic, is an ethic of renunciation, not an ethic of assertion. It was expressed first by Socrates when he said to his incredulous interlocutors that it's better to suffer evil than to do it. And later in our tradition, deepened by an affirmation that every human being is infinitely precious. In its religious formulation, it affirms that every human life is sacred. And sometimes it's expressed in stories and parables that tell us that all of us, without exception, are God's children, or we're all created in God's image. Goodness rather than nobility is its focal concept. Goodness as it's been revealed in the lives of saints, and which invites a capital G. And only this latter ethic, I believe, can find words to find fully amongst us, to enable us to see the full humanity of those who suffer severe, ineradicable and degrading affliction. I want now to discuss my father's goodness as it showed in his behaviour towards, towards my mother and to Mitchell, to their need that was constant and to their desperate relationship for which he pitied them because he knew it would consume them. His compassion went deep I've known nobody who felt so visibly the pain of others 
but it cost him. My father wasn't a saint. In him, the two conceptions of the ethical that I sketched a moment ago lived in considerable tension. And that's partly why he was such a complex and interesting man. Though he wasn't at all a sensitive New Age guy, he responded to his friend Mitru, who had cuckolded him, and to my mother, who had many times betrayed him, with an open-hearted, generous concern for their welfare. He even, as I said, paid their rent when, as often happened, they were threatened with eviction because my mother was unable to control her spending, a symptom like her promiscuity, commonly associated with manic depression. His compassion went deep, but it did not extinguish the humiliation he felt because his friend had cuckolded him. He had been born into a culture in which honour was, at least for men, the focal ethical concept, the value under which other values were organised. And for that reason, few of his compatriots had much sympathy for his attitude towards my mother and Mitra. Some despised it, though not him, I'm glad to say. It was bad enough, they thought, that a good friend had cuckolded him and made his wife pregnant, but he compounded the dishonour in, in their eyes by paying their rent when threatened with eviction. Did he have no shame, they asked. Socrates would have said that my father should not have been humiliated by the wrong done to him by Mitra, that only wrongdoers are shamed. And a saint exhibiting to a greater degree the kind of goodness that showed in my father might say the same. But although he was truly a man who, like Socrates, would rather suffer evil than to do it, my father was not a saint. He suffered hurt and humiliation, but he was good to an astonishing degree, and his goodness showed in how he treated my mother and Mitra. But his compassion for them was of a kind that could exist in him only because he was someone for whom at least much of the time goodness, rather than nobility or honour, was the concept that determined his ethical perspective. Or to put it another way, it was because he was a man whose understanding of integrity, courage, honour and nobility were transformed in the light of an ethical conception in which goodness was the focal concept. And it was compassion of a kind, possible only, I think, in a man who had it in him to respond, as my father did, to Vatsik. In Romulus, my father, I called my father's defining ethical outlook compassionate fatalism. And I resist perversely, it might seem to many people, calling him, as so many people do who praise him, I resist calling him a man of strong, sometimes rigid principle. In fact, it would be an exaggeration with point to say he had no principles at all. It wasn't principle that informed his behaviour towards my mother and Mitra. People were, even horror was, often critical of his behaviour towards Christina and Mitra. And my father's reply always was, in effect, that there was nothing else for him to do. His compassion, as I said, went deep, but one shouldn't think of it as an, simply an emotion, the passion of compassion, Hannah Arendt once called it, that overwhelmed him with its force. He was not a man of whom one should say that his good heart all too often overruled his head. <clears throat> if my father's compassion had been an emotional force that simply overwhelmed him, then when he said to Hora that he could not deny my mother's need, Hora might have urged him to try, as one might if someone believed that a person's generous emotions were overruling the decrees of a sensible head. But Hora never did because he knew that to do so would betray a serious misunderstanding of the kind of impossibility my father expressed when he said there was nothing else that he could do. To have urged him to behave differently on the assumption that he should try to resist a force that compelled him to do as he did would be like saying when Martin Luther said, here I stand, I can do no other, thereby launching the Protestant Reformation. It would be like saying to Luther, come on, Luther, give it a go. It might not be so hard. <laughs> Luther wasn't complaining that he was, as it were, psychically nailed to the spot by an emotion so strong that he couldn't resist it, though his head made him sometimes wonder whether he should. 
To find it impossible, as my father did, to turn one's back on someone's need is itself a heightened awareness of what it means for a human being to be in such need. Awareness that is interdependent with a kind of impossibility that he expressed when he said he couldn't turn his back on my mother and Mitru's often desperate need. Earlier I said that if someone were standing by my father's grave and were to ask, who was this man? Then I hope that the story I told in Romulus, my father, would be a truthful answer. I'm far from sure that it could be an answer if someone asked that question standing by my mother's grave. And that's partly because there is less detail in the book. Detail about her in the book is indeed scant. She died when I was 12, and nobody now alive knows more about her than I do, not in Australia anyway. But there is a deeper reason. David Parker, a literary critic, claims that I'm unjust to my mother in the book. He oscillates between two reasons for saying this. One is that I'm not sufficiently attentive or open to her point of view because, he believes, I see her always from the point of view of my father's values. I think that's false, but I'll say nothing about it here. The other reason is more interesting. It's this. It's because, he thinks, the book is written in a narrative genre that is shaped by a perspective determined by my father's value. He thinks it's a genre in which we cannot see Christina as fully alive. Parker put it slightly differently, and I quote him. Gator is surely right that the vocabulary of character is too narrow and indeed is no doubt part of what kills her. We clearly need another sort of moral vocabulary, a more capaciously romantic one, to capture the tragic dimensions of her thwarted vitality. This then is the question that Parker raises. Does the narrative genre of Romulus, my father, allow my mother to become individuated sufficiently for the book to answer the question, who was this woman? I don't know the answer to this question, but I'll try to explain why I take it seriously. Part of the reason is to be found, I think, in a passage in which I describe my response to seeing my father for the first time after he had admitted himself as a patient to a psychiatric hospital. I was 15 years old and horror was with me. I hope you'll excuse me for quoting at length. I quote. The hospital represented a foreign world to me, one whose beliefs were shaped by ideas that I instinctively felt to be in conflict with those that had enabled me to understand the events of my childhood. I could no longer see my father's illness just from the perspective of our life at Frogmore. Strange though it may sound, my sense of that life, of the ideas that informed it, was given intensity and colour by the light and the landscape of the area. The hills looked as old as the earth because they were rounded by millennia and also because the grey and equally rounded granite boulders that stood amongst the long yellow grasses, sharply delineated at all times of day by the summer sun, made them look prehistoric. More than anything, however, the glorious, tall, burnt yellow grasses, as a boy they came to my chest and even sometimes over my head, moving irregularly against the deep blue sky, dominated the images of my childhood and gave colour to my freedom and also to my understanding of suffering. In the morning they inspired cheerful energy of the kind that made you whistle. At midday, in partnership with an unforgiving sun and alive with insects and other creatures, they intimidated. But in the late afternoon, towards dusk, everything was softened by a light that graced the area in a melancholy beauty that could pierce one's soul. Religion, metaphysics, or the notions of fate and character as they informed tragedy were suited to that light and that landscape. The assumptions of psychiatric medicine, affected as they then were by, the, by psychiatry's debunking of metaphysics in its long struggle to become accepted as a science, were not. Life at Frogmore, in that landscape, under that light, nourished the sense given to me by my father and horror of the contrast of 
between the malleable laws of conventions made by human beings to reconcile and suit their many interests and the uncompromising authority of morality, always the judge, never merely the servant of our interests. And for that reason, tragedy, with its calm pity for the affliction it depicts, was a genre that first attracted my passionate allegiance. I recognised in it the concepts that had illuminated the events of my childhood. They enabled me to see Mitra, my mother, my father, and Vatsek living amongst his boulders as the victims of misfortune in their different ways broken by it, but not thereby diminished. I won't try to explain all I mean in that passage, for me, one of the most important in the book. If I did, I'd fall into obscurantism. I wouldn't write that way in a book of philosophy. Yet I'm quite certain that if the landscape had not been so important to me, if, it, if I did not then love it as I still do, I could not have written the book that I did. It's not just that I couldn't have written the passages describing the landscape with the same feeling. The entire mood of the book would have been different, even, I think, the rhythm of its sentences. And I won't even try to say what that implies about truth and perspective if one thinks, as one should, I believe, that content cannot be separated from style, which, of course, must include tone and rhythm. Metaphysical doctrines of determinism are far from my mind when I speak of my father's fatalism. I mean that for him the human condition was defined by our vulnerability to misfortune. But now when I think of it, I realise that his demeanour to the whole of life was shaped by something like the same attitude. Certainly it was to the animals that he raised and cared for. He took great pleasure in them, but always his attitude to them was coloured by pity for their vulnerability, and especially for their vulnerability to human cruelty. His pity extended to all of living nature, to the trees that he cared for when they were stricken with disease, and even to the countryside when it was parched by drought, the grasses normally golden in summer, bleached white, and the earth with large cracks in it, some as wide as six inches and as deep as ten feet. Perhaps it sounds absurd, but I hope that the story I told would be one whose events and characters would be bathed in the light and colours of that landscape. I hope that in the telling of it, I could achieve the same calm pity that I attributed to chapter two tragedy as a literary genre. My father disliked the landscape, and even after 40 years, he couldn't become reconciled to it aesthetically. He always spoke with longing of what he called the beautiful trees of Europe. Yet, he always seemed to me at ease in the landscape, even if not at home in it. Always he went without a shirt in summer, his torso brown going to black, almost as black as the hundred or so small bush flies that would settle on it. The colours of the summer landscape were also the colour of our lives. My mother disliked the landscape even more than my father did, and she was never at ease in it. It was alien to her, and she seemed alien to it. A troubled, intense, passionate and cultured city girl from Central Europe, she showed from the beginning signs of a psychological illness that would prove tragic. It was foolish for my father and me to hope that she could settle in a derelict farmhouse in a harsh landscape that aggravated her torment. She tried a number of times to kill herself before she succeeded. I describe her return from hospital after one suicide attempt at Frogmore. I quote. The road from Baring up to Malort was 500 metres from Frogmore, connected to the house by a rough track. The taxi that brought my mother from the hospital left her at the junction of the road and the track, probably at her request. I first saw her when she was 200 metres or so from the house, alone, small, frail, walking with an uncertain gait and distracted air. In that vast landscape, with only crude wire fences and a rough track to mark a human impression on it, she appeared forsaken. She looked to me as though she'd returned from the dead, unsure about the value of the achievement. She made light of her attempted suicide to me, but her vivacity was gone. Preoccupied and uncommunicative, she lay in bed most days, except for an hour or two when she went for walks. <clears throat> One evening when she didn't return from her walk, my father and I searched for the paddocks, calling to her, but heard no answer. 
Again, my father ran to Lily's, a neighbouring farm, from where he phoned the police. He feared that she tried to kill herself. And later that night, I stood knee-deep in the waters of a nearby swamp, lit, lit by searchlights as the police, my father Lily and others, searched for her body. They didn't find her, and at about 3am, everybody went home. In the morning, she came home, bleeding from a deep triangular cut in one of her shins. She said she'd injured herself falling over a log, and dispirited her to spend the night sleeping beside it. She went to bed, offering no explanation then or ever. End of quote. One way of putting Parker's point, perhaps, would be to say that just as my mother was ill at ease in the actual landscape of central Victoria, so she is Ill, as, Ill at ease as a character in a book whose narrative genre is conditioned by that landscape and its natural congruence with categories of character, fate and metaphysics. Indeed, I come close to saying that in the book when I try to explain how inadequate a certain kind of contrast between character and personality was to the reality of my mother. I quote, Character, or character as they pronounced it, that is my father and horror, with the emphasis on the second syllable, was a central moral concept for my father and for horror. It stood for a settled disposition for which, it was for which it was possible, rightly, to admire someone. The men and women where I grew up and its surroundings in the 50s admired character, even when, if rarely, they had little of it themselves. Tom Lilly and others disliked my mother partly because they saw her engaging vivacity as a dangerously seductive manifestation of personality in a woman they believed to be lacking entirely in character. For someone like my mother, highly intelligent, deeply sensuous, anarchic and unstable, this emphasis on character, given an Australian emphasis, was the wrong conceptual environment for her to find herself and for others to understand her. It was also emblematic of a culture whose limitations were partly the reason that she couldn't overcome hers. End of quote. Perhaps those comments on how uncongenial the conceptual environment of that time was to the possibility that most people would fully understand my mother and that she might understand herself apply also to the narrative genre of the book. Perhaps that genre is not one in which she can appear fully individuated, fully a presence in the world, a distinctive perspective on it, rather than a ghost haunting a story whose genre will never allow her to appear quite real. That's anyhow the thought that I take from Parker. I don't know whether it's true. But what's clearly true is this, that genre is essential to narrative and genre opens and closes possibilities of characterization. Well, with so many qualifications, what becomes then of truth? The issues here are no different, I think, from those in the philosophy of value more generally. A story that discloses identity, that answers the question, who was this person, is necessarily written from a perspective on value, perspectives that in my judgment can't be underwritten by philosophy alone or even by philosophy together with other discursive disciplines in the natural sciences or the social and psychological sciences, for example. My father's European friends, you will remember, criticised his compassionate responsiveness to the needs of Mitra and my mother. Isn't it bad enough, they said, that your friend cuckolded you? Must you debase yourself by paying his rent and the rent of the wife who betrayed you? Have you no honour, no shame? Well, my father was a man of honour, and far from being shameless, he lived by a conception of goodness that transformed his understanding of when fears of dishonour and shame were appropriate. What, however, if someone who had criticised his sense of honour in the way I just reported was asked, what if such a person was asked, what was Romulus Gator like? And suppose him to reply that Romulus did and said the things that his son said he did in the book about him, but that while his son celebrated Romulus's values, that he despised them. They were, he continues, the values of a man whose foolish heart led him to dishonour himself by paying the rent of his wife when she lived with a man who cuckolded him 
They were the values of someone who was foolish enough to believe that a man who was clearly mad and who lived between boulders on a hillside where he talked to himself and cooked in his urine should be treated as though he was not a fitting object of condescension. Quite clearly, someone who would say these things of my father would tell a different story than the one I had told. Did my father pay my mother's rent and Mitra's rent? He did, it's a fact. Was he therefore a good and generous man? Or was he a cuckold who dishonoured himself, dishonoured himself still further? To tell a story that would show who he was, one would have to answer that second question. But there's no neutral ground, I think, on which to plant one's feet, feet if one tries to answer that question. And the same, I believe, is true of my father's attitude to Vatsik. And that's why I said earlier that in writing Romulus, I wanted to bear witness to the values by which he lived and to the values themselves. When she gave this lecture that I'm giving tonight, Inga Clendinen said that we're all storytellers, all autobiographers, that we tell in one way or another stories about ourselves, to ourselves and to others all the time. The first draft of, Rom the draft of Romulus took me three weeks to write, so the story must have written, been written in my heart long before I actually wrote it. And I wrote it with an intensity that was completely lacking in literary self-consciousness. When I reflected on what I'd written, I realised that it had little in common with a kind of biography that naturally takes a novelistic form, the kind that Parker thinks would be adequate to my mother. Because of its emphasis on character, fate and affliction, I thought of it not so much as a biography, and certainly not an autobiography, as some people sometimes call it, I thought of it as a kind of tragic poem in that ancient sense in which the Greeks spoke of poetry. You'll recall that in Romulus I said I spoke of tragedy as a literary genre and I said that it shows a calm pity for the affliction it depicts. You may also recall that I hoped that my book would show that same calm pity for the people whose story it told. I hoped that it could show that though all of them were to some degree broken by their suffering, none was diminished by it. So in closing, I want to tell a story that shows the perspective from which it can matter deeply whether I succeeded in that hope and therefore whether the story I told was true. When the book was first published ten years ago, I read from it at a refuge for homeless people reluctantly because I was aware that they came there for lunch, not for literature. <laughs> At one stage, a man, obviously mentally ill, called for me to stop reading. He raised his head, which he'd held in his hands like this, and he exclaimed, God's in this book. I remember the times when, as a student, I worked in a mental hospital and was anxious about what he would do next. I mean, he explained, that it's filled with love. And later he paced up and down the floor and again threw his hands in the air and exclaimed, Your father's a genius. And again I wondered what's going to happen next. And he said, I mean, a genius of the spirit. On that same day, five or six girls, prostitutes in the area, not one of them 20, asked me again and again to read about my mother. I read to them passages that I've not read before or have since in public because it's too painful for me to read them. In my mother's troubled life, they saw something of their own and I hope that they saw her suffering and therefore what she shared with them in the light of the love that the man who spoke before them had said filled the book. I'm certain that they would not repeatedly have asked me to read about my mother if they had detected in my portrayal of her what one critic called a morally bankrupt woman, or if they had seen in her a characterless woman in the pejorative sense of that expression. The spiritual hunger that showed in their recognition that my mother was like them, a deeply troubled soul, 
and the tribute by man destitute of all worldly goods and achievements, bereft of all status and quite mad, moved and gratified me more than all the accolades that the book has received.